Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, everybody is welcome to uh, listen and to and, and you know and to follow the presentation. This is an international webinar. It's going to be delivered by uh, Professor Joan Raul. Uh, she is a full professor and dean of the faculty of school of the School of Business at Medica, uh, Medica Evers uh, College, uh, City University of New York. And she has been involved in this uh, entrepreneurship and other associated subjects for a very, very long time. She has an understanding and outstanding curriculum vitae. And uh, I'm not going to do that job because uh, this is uh, available. She is also in charge of uh, section B of uh, our electronic journal, which is uh, Inglo Mayor that many, many people know. And uh, therefore, uh, she should be by now very well known in this part of the world. And uh, so uh, in this opportunity, she was kind enough to accept my invitation to deliver a talk on a book. Uh, the book is, I, I suppose, is going to be released very, very soon. And the title of the book is Handbook on the Future of Work and Entre Entrepreneurship of the Undeserved. Uh, what I would like to do is to thank once again uh, Joan Roll and uh, for all the support she has given us. Uh, and I hope that in the, near, in the future, she will continue to to help us uh, with the uh, expertise and uh, uh, all, all the experience she has. And uh, well, I'm more than happy. I have a lot of love and affection for Jan Rowan and uh, her family. My regard to uh, Grace, uh, her daughter, and her granddaughter is uh, only one, she's uh, Abigail, and uh, well, all her family member. Well, uh, my dear uh, friend, please, uh, you are welcome to uh, start. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Roberto, Professor Acevedo. I indeed am very happy that you invited me uh, to share some of the work that we have done uh, since our meeting in 2016, when we were at the Conference of uh, Social Entrepreneurship and uh, Corporate Social Responsibility. And I thank you too for all of the collaborations that we've had uh, in the papers that we've written on Chile education, Chile the future of uh, work, and, 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 and other topics that we have uh, worked on together. It indeed has been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, the book that uh, I want to introduce you to, to this morning is a handbook on the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. There are 14 chapters and approximately 25 authors. The book has been released on Amazon in soft copy uh, and it's also available via Kindle and, uh, and Kindle Unlimited. So um, I, I would like to uh, share with you what's in the presentation. Uh, I've been doing a couple of these presentations to spreading the word because it's more about the work than the book. And the challenge that we have and the challenge that we face is the worldwide income inequity. And COVID-19 has done nothing but exasperate that income inequity. I'll talk a little bit about our work, uh, global work, introduction and purpose of the handbook, a few research questions, design, uh, but the focus of the presentation will be on the four sections of the book. And then uh, hope for the future of work and entrepreneurship is back to the lead chapter where we believe the authors, the researchers have indeed presented a bottom up strategy for the underserved that indeed can be replicated. And then I'll talk a little bit about practical implications, conclusions, and our charge. I do have myself on a timer because uh, I, I, I can talk about these uh, topics for a long time. It's been a love and a passion of mine. And so I am going to pace myself. If indeed, if you have a question, let me know. This is how the book looks, a handbook on the future of work and entrepreneurship. It is indeed available now, but this is the main question. 
that we as a humanity have, the equity jungle. A lot of times when the programs come out across the country, across the globe, it says, okay, everyone has a fair shot at it, but it fails to look at this, uh, the, the fact that everyone doesn't have the same skills, everyone doesn't have the same access to resources, everyone doesn't have the same access to even networks. And it's very um, uh, obvious in this, in this little cartoon, it says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Have you heard that before? Please climb that tree. And, it, and you can see that the different animals have different skills and environments, uh, but only one or two may be able to climb a tree. I, I would ask that you mute your mic. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Please mute your mics. There's some background noise. Okay. The, the, our challenge, our challenge is a worldwide income inequity. When we first started this work, uh, Professor Roberto and myself in 2016, there was not data to look across the globe. It was not normalized. In 2018, that data became available from an organization and they have continued to make the data available. And, uh, and this is 2020 data that you're looking at. And the darker the map is, the more inequitable it is. And what you can see is that the top 10% of those in the country are earning anywhere between 50 to 70% of the income in the country. That what that means is the other 90% of the population has to live on or drive their uh, means on uh, the residual. And so the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved is a struggle, not just for Africa, Latin America, uh, or other countries. It's a struggle for humanity. It's a global problem that we must uh, address. And so I've captured the essence of our work uh, in this quote by the recent uh, book, Work Disrupt Disrupted by Jeff Swartz. And what the quote says is, as leaders, and I will add as researchers, we need to allow ourselves to experiment, try things out, make adjustments. Leaders navigating the future of work will find themselves experiencing the uncomfortable stages of the creative process. You know, it's not always going to feel good to do the right thing, but we as researchers, we as leaders, uh, may be surprised at what we discover when we dig down deep to look for uh, answers to the problems that we've had that we have not found. You know, the poor have been with us, uh, inadequate work has been with us for generations and we have not solved the problem. So if we continue to look back at our old solutions, we will get our old results. I don't have to tell you guys this. I mean, I see some in the audience are from India, uh, you're in Chile uh, and I'm in, in the US, but we know that underserved communities will face the greatest marginalization due dis to disruption in the 21st century caused by the technology and other factors. I mentioned this earlier, in our previous research, we developed papers and presentations on the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. And we did this in our work in Kenya, in our work in Chile, in our work in Jamaica, and in our work in the U.S. But the purpose of this handbook was to extend that body of work beyond those countries to go to countries like India, Bangladesh, uh, and some of the other countries, Nigeria, uh, on West Africa, some of the other countries uh, seeking researchers and authors to give voice, their voice, not top down, but bottom up voices that we had not heard before. So we looked at some common things in the literature, but technology and innovation was where we focused on transforming the future of work and entrepreneurship for underserved. And we didn't wanna just bring up problems, we wanted to also bring up recommendations and I will share at least one. Here, I'm gonna start talking about the sections of the book. There are four sections of the book. The first section is technology and innovation for the future of work and entrepreneurship. The lead chapter of the, uh, 
section in the lead chapter of the book, and I'll tell you why in a little later in the presentation, is social innovation strategies to transform slums into successful neighborhoods in Latin America. This was a demonstration of what actually happened and not an abstract thought or an, of, or an idea. And we believe that it could have some replication implications for other areas. Um, Technology is disrupting the creative industries and entrepreneurial ventures in the underserved communities. This was a case looking at what happened in COVID-19. A lot of the creatives uh, were used to face-to-face -face engagement. They had to learn how to digitize their work and develop models of monetizing it, which has happened. And what they found was their reach was longer. Uh, and so th th there was a silver lining in the cloud of COVID. Uh, another area is we, we're aware that in many markets, uh, the population has left the urban areas, gone to rural, uh, left the rural areas, gone to er urban areas. But this particular case, look at the agrarian sector and how with one in one product and one case study uh, that you could actually make the sector and the region um, more uh, conducive to uh, uh, developing work and income for those there. And this is uh, 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 what we brought forth in this paper. And again, this is uh, as it relates to Latin America. Uh, the, the last area in this uh, paper is artificial, in this chapter is artificial intelligence automation and the future of work and entrepreneurship for the unserved, a review of the literature on the gains and losses. We did not want to present a body of work that did not look directly at AI and machine learning and how it was impacting this sector. And the co-authors from here are from Kenya and Vietnam, and one of the case studies is a Vietnam, Japan-based company, AI company, and how they took the AI technology and delivered it to kiosks so that those who were uh, on the underserved on the streets could have technology access at a lower level. Again, how do we and not run away from the technology, but engage the technology to help those who could benefit most in the underserved? The second section is diverse and inclusive labor markets and uh, workforce diversity, creating profit and employment opportunities is a chapter that was written by a Babson College faculty member. And those of you who have been in the work of entrepreneurship know that uh, Babson has been nationally and internationally ranked in entrepreneurship for decades for the work that they have done. And what I liked about this piece is it says that diversity is not just a good thing to do. It means good business. It means that you are able to have a, a workforce that looks like the customer base and can indeed leverage that asset to, to be more profitable. And so many, I think many corporations globally can benefit from really understanding if you want to help your stakeholders, and that does include uh, those who earn, own the uh, firms as well as those working in the firms and the communities that they serve, diversity is a good a factor into. And the, the next chapter is the effect of COVID pandemic on the performance of women on micro enterprises in Kenya. In Kenya and, and many of the African countries, <clears throat> the women work very hard to take care of those families. And what happens is when the women no longer work, the family no longer has access. So they give a discussion of what the lockdowns and curfews, and they talk more importantly, when uh, a national or international disaster happens again, what are some of the things that we could do to help uh, save some of those women on micro enterprises or at least cushion them from the impact of uh, a COVID-19 like factor. And then fi finally in the chapter, we talk about female immigrant entrepreneurs in the US. Many, many, many immigrants come to the US with the hope of increasing income, generating wealth for their families. And many find that they are not 
necessarily welcome into the formal workforce. And so what we saw or what the office saw was a great deal of the women who were trying to launch businesses. And when I talked to the offices and I said, you know, most of the businesses that launch worldwide fail within a certain amount of time, the research that would be good after this is what to do to keep those businesses um, uh, in, in uh, running long after the initial period that of startup, uh, you know, how do they scale and grow? And so that's a, a area that, that we would like to look at later. The third section is the small business development. Um, small businesses are the engine that drive many, many countries around the world. And so we were looking at in these uh, four cases, some of the issues that they're dealing with. And in this particular uh, one, the, the lead uh, chapter in this section, it talks about a specific case where entrepreneurship uh, dollars and investment are being sent to the urban areas, draining the rural area of its population and its other resources. So this pa paper looks at what if we uh, reallocate some of those dollars to help make the rural economies more uh, invigorated and to take off some of the burdens uh, uh, in, in the city, uh, in the cities. Um, I was in Bangladesh uh, right before the uh, COVID-19 and the cities are packed. Uh, it's unbelievable. But when you go into the rural areas, as I did, you could see the evidence of abandonment. And uh, so this paper is saying, well, everybody can't be in the urban area. All of the investment shouldn't go there. What can we do to make the rural areas more sufficient and more attractive to the population? The next chapter is on the middle size, uh, micro and middle size firms in India. And it, this was interesting <clears throat> because it used multiple firms in the case studies to look at how they were scaling and what we could do in the future to take these small businesses that survive. Because as I told you, many of the businesses around the world, they start up and they don't survive. But how to take those who, who are there and have gotten to the stage of, 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 of medium and small and how do we scale them up and what do they need from um, uh, private public partnerships that might work? So that was an interesting uh, case. And then the other one is financing small businesses in underserved communities efficiently during a crisis, a lesson from COVID-19. What this one shares is that many, as in the US, many small businesses went out of business and many were not able to come back. And you take that and magnify it with those that are hit in developing countries. And when those businesses don't come back, you have families that are in dire destitute. So uh, around the world, uh, it was looking at uh, what, what can we do to, to help support the businesses from going out of business so that they, they don't have to come back so far in a fiscal manner uh, to, to, to re-engage and to uh, help the uh, economy in the communities that they are in. The last one is the legacy of entrepreneurship, inclusivity, and sustainable social well being in India. And it talked about social entrepreneurship in India and the benefits to the whole society, not just looking at the benefits to the individuals or the benefits to the firms, but how does the entire uh, socio ecosystem fare when you look at social entrepreneurship from that perspective? And the final section is education and training. And the lead chapter there is access and impact combining community first and digital methods for entrepreneurial education. What was nice about this particular chapter is it looked at including social engagement in, uh, in the community as a part of the curriculum. So the students would learn that it's not just about their business or their innovation, but how could they take that 
back into the communities that they came from to help benefit the communities. And that was a successful demonstration and it talks about it uh, in that chapter. Agency training and determinants of success among beautypreneurs. This was one of my favorites. It actually talked about the women. You know, the women in uh, India, if you look at the data, very few are engaged in work. It's mostly um, male dominated work force. And so, especially in times of COVID, the family is looking for additional income. So, you know, the, the male in the family may already have an income and in times of hardship, there is very little ways to increase that. And so, uh, the, the, it was a public-private partnership to, to uh, bring online training uh, for beautypreneurs to to the women, and 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 one of the issues is some of the cultural context. You know, um, I, I I think if you're not culturally aware, then you don't understand what these women went through to to actually do this. Uh, one of the women actually said her husband didn't want her engaged in the business. Her husband didn't want her to do it, but she felt she had to help with her family and she wanted the ability to help with her family. So uh, she took the course in the training. And once she started making money, she found that her husband saw it as a benefit that she was not able to, she was not only able to help herself, but she was able to help him and the rest of the family and life got better. So in the cultural context, it, um, you know, it, 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 as we started in the beginning, it may be uncomfortable, but uncomfortable is not necessarily a bad place to be if it changes and transforms your community, even transform your family to a better life. And the last chapter in this section and in the book is creating the next generation of entrepreneurs for entrepreneurial growth in emerging markets. And it's talking about Nigeria. In Nigeria, there is a vast amount of injection of um, products and services from China. And what this pointed to was as the China low prices are dominant, um, they are driving out the ability of the local uh, uh, mar uh, entrepreneurs to actually be competitive in the marketplace. And uh, it's kind of like a, a, not a warning, but a, a discussion and a charge to if uh, developers come externally into these markets, how are you going to help support and engage these local entrepreneurs, local businesses, if they're not to stay in the current businesses, how to train and reskill them to get to other businesses where they could support and uh, uh, sustain their families. So this was a different case where you know, there is a lot of economic and entrepreneurial growth in areas of entrepreneur in areas of Nigeria, but where is it going and how will it impact that country in the future? I promise you I will come back to where I think uh, we have real hope for the future. There are a lot of issues and problems in the income gap and closing the income gap, which we have not been successful doing in all of our lifetimes. And the UN's number one goal is to uh, alleviate poverty. And it looks like that is slipping away, uh, further away, especially since COVID. But here's a situation where you know, the, the, the income gap wasn't the issue. It was the quality of life of the people that were served in the community. Uh, uh, our, our authors, uh, Bernadette and our, one of our yeah. true mentors, Professor Roger Kaufman, who uh, passed away last year. He was a mentor for the group. Uh, um, he was on the industry advisory board uh, at Medgar Evers College, City University of New York, where I serve as dean. Uh, and he was truly a pioneer in the area of performance measurement and management and community development. And so Roger and Mariano, uh, worked with a team of folks in several Latin American countries, Argentina, Mexico, Panama, and they also worked in the US over 25 years. So their work, uh, their body of work, Roger had over 300 uh, articles published in his lifetime and over 40 books. So a huge volume of work around this area. And what they said was top down is not what's going to work. 
It's bottom up, understanding and listening to what was important to the people. So in this particular case, it, they, were, they went into drug economies, the economies that were being driven by the under economy. And it was the women who said, the money is not as important to us as saving the lives of our husbands, our sons, our grandsons to help us raise these children that we have. So, you know, we would forego a lot of the income uh, if we had a way to survive and thrive in our communities that would allow us to keep our families intact. So many coming from the outside will say, might have said, oh, well, here's a way you can make more money. And they were saying, we got the money. The money is not as important as the quality of life for our generations and the generations to follow. So they shared a vision. The shared vision was to save our families not income gap, not wealth gap, but save our families. And so they looked at the housing because they were in slums and how to revision how housing would be. And they actually built companies that really built buildings that were uh, housing for the community to relocate in. And every sector that they needed engagement in for that economy, they built businesses and micro businesses around. So they, they built an internal workforce and education and training was a part of that workforce to give folks the skills that they needed for those jobs and for those businesses. They had a uh, uh, health and quality of life businesses, waste management businesses, tourism business, security, and uh, they had public private partnerships. The point here is, is about creating a co-created vision one that engages everyone from the bottom up, one that doesn't just look at the public sector to solve our problems, but working together public and private sector to solve the problems with that one vision of uh, maintaining a quality of life for the next generation. So we believe that that model is replicatable uh, across uh, uh, other areas of the underserved. It uh, has been shown and measured uh, to work. And I just completed a, um, a chapter in another book where the whole focus was on this particular model and looking at working with communities and listening to communities from the bottom up to create solutions that are sustainable. So what do we propose? We propose that unity and community and capacity building is vital to create a shared prosperity. You need to start with the shared vision. A lot of times as researchers, we have our vision and our understanding, but until we talk and listen to those stakeholders where their lives are involved, we really can't interpret what is best for them. So in this handbook, we have shared a summary of the uh, chapters which will be included in our handbook and perspectives on what the future of work and entrepreneurship will evolve into in the new normal. And I want to take some time and really focus on our last point. We hope that this analysis will create further dialogue in the academy, but we don't want this work to sit on shelves and, and get dusty like many of our research papers do. We are hoping that industry will look at this work and policymakers will look at this work and, 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 and look at how to ensure that the underserved are included in the future of work and entrepreneurship, not for the normal we had before. The normal we had before was poverty for the majority of the world, as you saw in the data. We are hoping for a better normal that is more inclusive of all the people uh, instead of just some of the people. So what is our charge? And again, I took a, a, a quote from uh, Jeff's work and work disrupted. Indeed, our communities can serve as laboratories for innovations, such as the laboratories that uh, Roger Kaufman and Mario Bernard's days uh, had uh, throughout Latin America, where we can develop and test reskilling programs. AI and machine learning is here. 
we don't know some of the jobs that are going to be coming up, but we do know that we will need to have our workforce reskilled because the tools that they have now are not what they may need in the future. We need to explore the creation of transition nets. How? When we make these transitions, can we support the entrepreneurs, the families, the women, all of those who are trying to get to the next level where they need to be skilled, uh, but still are living in the present? And reset local agendas as a precursor to resetting national policies and programs. You know, a lot of times, by the time the programs get in place, they are answering questions that we have gone long uh, beyond and uh, and they're not addressing the current need how do we make it more dynamic such that when these national policies do evolve that they are really addressing the current issues of the workforce uh, and the entrepreneurs and so i want to uh, thank you for this time with you to share with you, not just the book, the book is a way or a vehicle for us to bring to you this issue or this challenge. But the work is how do we take a system from secondary education, which across the world is not producing what we need for the workforce, and higher education, who is also failing and at increasing uh, um, uh, amounts of uh, 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 cost and debt for many students. Uh, how do we take where we are and get us to where we need to be, uh, not just as advocates, but engage in the transformation uh, to the future of work and entrepreneurship for those who are underserved. And so I thank you for this time with you. Um, and uh, I, I hope that there is something I have said uh, in the last 30 minutes that I've had with you that will cause you not to just pause, not to just think, but to do, to take action. What can you do to change and transform the future of work and entrepreneurship for us all? It is not just about me. It's not about the editors. It is not even about the authors, but it's how we are all going to, as in the example of uh, 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 Mario and Roger, how are we going to create, co-create a vision together, shaping our own destiny, shaping our own future, and being our authentic selves as we go along. With that, I wanna thank you and I can open it up to questions if you have any. Yes. Uh, well, okay. thank, you. thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, first of all, let me... Uh, 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 well, uh, let me just welcome uh, Professor Ambarasan, a very good friend of mine. Yes, yes. And, Thank uh, you for uh, giving me opportunity. I have uh, some doubts. Yes, May... yes uh, go, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rolle, am I correct? Yes. Rolle. May I raise a few questions? Of course. Of course. I'm yes, yes. <laughs> so in the section two and three, you have discussed about that is workforce discriminations law also carried out in the five different Indian companies. Am I correct? Yes, yes. That is uh, micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs. Yes. Companies. Yes. Is there uh, any... Uh, feedback received from that uh, workforce discrimination law regarding that one? Uh, okay, so I, I'm going back to to the section on diverse and inclusive labor markets, or are you talking about the section on small business development? Yes. Small business development. Yes, micro, small, and medium. Oh, MSS. yes, okay. Gotcha. MSME. Gotcha. MSME. Gotcha. 
Yeah, okay, got you. Okay, so this one, uh, it looked at five, uh, five companies, uh, small and medium, and they had an index for them. So it wasn't, it wasn't looking at all of them, but it was looking at five successful companies. And what they were asking was, what will it take to help scale these companies so that they could uh, add more impact to the economy, hire more people, et cetera, et cetera. And so it wasn't, it wasn't looking at all of the um, of small and medium companies. It was a case study approach of looking at five and trying to develop some kind of recommendations from the outcomes of those five. And so your question was, the question was, is, is there discrimination in that marketplace? Yes, yes. Okay, so now I have to be honest with you. This was in India. So um, they did not talk about, and, and there very well could be discrimination uh, across uh, sectors uh, in, in the marketplace, but that was not discussed in the paper, okay? Uh, in the other paper on diversity and inclusion, workforce diversity, creating profit and employment opportunities, that's a US-based one. It did allude to more of the discrimination in the marketplace against African Americans or people of color, um, uh, and 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 there it was making the case uh, that uh, the discrimination was causing a disruption that was not good for business because a lot of good talent wasn't getting in to do the work that they could do. That that particular paper did address discrimination, but it wasn't related to India. It was related to the U.S. Yes, very nicely, sharply, you have categorically distinguished, nice. Thank you. One more question, Doctor. Yes. Uh, you have also carried out many approaches like multiple approach, then mixed approach. So many approaches are uh, available in that uh, scenario, right? Yes. So have you, have you uh, selected any scientific approach towards finding the solution for uh, entrepreneurship workshop workforce. Okay, so now, now therein lies the question. Is there a one size that fits all? Is there one methodology that could address all of our issues and our challenges? The reason that we tried so many, and I'll be uh, very honest with you, we, we were working uh, in, since 2016 and we had several approaches we were using and we thought that we were coming up with some kind of abstract solution and then we found when we started working with Roger and uh, Mariano that they had been doing the work all along and it come up with what we had was a framework that hadn't been actionalized they had a framework that had been demonstrated and measured and, and, and proven. So, so, so if there was a methodology of the four, in the 14 chapters, because it's 14 chapters with uh, 25 different authors, the one that I, I think has the most promise is the one that was demonstrated in Latin America by uh, Kaufman and Ber Bernardez, where they went in and, uh, uh, with a, 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 an approach of primary, secondary data, longitudinal data. I mean, it, 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 it takes more time, but I, in terms of seeing real progress and output, uh, I think in, in this body of work, it has the most evidence of what has worked and what could work in the future. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't wanna say that there is one methodology because something that might've worked in Latin America may not work in, uh, in countries in Africa, but I can say that I think the approach is bottom up rather than top down. That I um, can say, that I can say. Yes, nice, nice. Yeah. Like, uh... It is also a scientific approach. Yes, right? yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Thank you. Are you okay? uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Very thank much. you for the questions. Uh, well, I wonder if uh, my friend uh, Carlos Contreras uh, would like to ask something to uh, Professor John Rowell. Uh, Carlos, uh, you are more than welcome. Good, uh, good morning to you. 
Uh, we okay. have uh, we have not talked for a very very long time, but we are very close friends. Yes. And uh, until we pass away both, but then we are going to meet somewhere else <laughs> and carry on talking about different things. And uh, okay. well, uh, I have uh, Joan uh, ask uh, a Carlos. Uh, Carlos is a very distinguished chemist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not because of my, it's a friend of mine, I know uh, his talent and uh, he's a very smart fellow, uh, to give us uh, his experience on some kind of presentation or whatever. And also, uh, I would like uh, very much uh, to, in, to, to interview him because you see people, and this is going to be a, a number of questions which I'm going to put forward to you. You don't mind, of course. And this is what uh, young people need, the experience of the senior people. People who have worked very, very, very hard indeed in their lifetime, and they can contribute with, uh, with some ideas and some advice to everybody. Uh, so Carlos, uh, would you like to ask something before we continue with uh, Chanamas, who is here as well? Okay, well, Roberto is a... Uh... Very nice to see you again. So it's made so long time. We have not face to face, no? Okay, well, um, Dr. Roll, I really appreciate your talk. It has been very interesting. I guess it, it touched, it engaged many problem or situation which is common all over the world and particularly in Chile. Now, mm -hmm. I am actually retired from university after 42, 45 years of work. But as uh, uh, Roberto says, um, I'm being very modest in our opinion. I think that we have something to say to young people. And maybe the, base, the, the main point is to get involved, to get enthusiastic with what is going on around, huh? not just be observed of what is going on. And in that respect, you know, in Chile, and probably you are very well informed what is going on in Chile, we are facing now a very interesting, I would say, historical moment, historical moment, yes, because as probably you know, we are uh, starting to have a read, a writing, writing a new constitution with constituted and the convention is constituted is conformed by 50% women and 50% men. Huh? And I think that touch uh, a very important point you are talking about, about the incidence of women's opinion on development. Huh? So uh, I guess that that is the first point. The second point is that uh, this convention is going to include People from origin, uh, I don't know the word in originarios, Robertus. Uh, it's uh, people who are supposed to be the very first one. Yes, yes, the, <laughs> the main, yes, <laughs> yes. In yes. the country. <laughs> yes, you know, and there is a discussion on how to take into account all different, or the many different uh, cultural branches existing actually in the country, which is not taking into account in the formal or in the official politics. So I'd like to ask you, and excuse me if I've been so long in my talk, which is your opinion, or if you know something about the situation in Chile in regard to what you are talking about? Thank you very much, Dr. Roll. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have to say, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, my work with uh, Roberto on Chile and education is dated of, uh, uh, we produced a couple of uh, papers maybe a few years ago, but I am not current on the current situation of what's going on. I apologize for that. No, I understand. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I, I can't speak to that right now. I, I apologize. Well, Roberto, you have a new job. You got to brief me at some point in time. Make sure I catch up <laughs> with what's going on in Chile. <laughs> well, uh, that is very true, actually. Uh, we have a plan. Mm -hmm. I... I did uh, uh, I, I did share my, my view uh, with uh, Joan about a book we, which uh, we're writing at the moment. The book is in progress. It's about the relationship between people, education, training, uh, and productive sector. 
a new strategy. And this is what we are going to do. And uh, I have invited uh, Joan Roll uh, to write a book, a chapter of the book, because so uh, she has a lot of experience. And now nowadays, what we actually need is people with experience which can share that uh, with the young people. What we actually need is uh, better people with uh, very, very good ideas and uh, people who feel, really feel that uh, work is the only way to make progress in life. But for that, a, a government should create the opportunity and the possibility for right. work for people. That's right. And uh, that, that is something very important. I'm not a politician myself, but uh, there is something. Uh, I, I do believe in human beings. I think human beings are the most important things I have ever seen uh, since I was born. And therefore, um, that is the reason you see, because I don't care about uh, the color, the, the black type of, uh, or whatever. Uh, what does that matter is just people. And uh, for that, you have to work very hard. It's not yet a question of uh, being concerned about people. It's a question about what can you actually of offer to these people and can, what can you really share your uh, attitude, your point of view, and your knowledge with them and to make them grow. People, as you know, uh, they don't come uh, to this world to suffer. The people come to this world to be happy. Right. And happiness is something that uh, people talk about. They fell in love, you see, and uh, they talk about happiness. And then you see, you will see them in court in one year time. And, and therefore, you see, this is a concept that uh, uh, John, Roland, and I, uh, we wrote something about happiness. And I think we need to, to carry on doing that. Uh, my question, uh, John, Roland, are uh, a lot. I'm going to, to ask you about emotional intelligence, which is something very important, I think. Well, what do you think emotional intelligence, which is the role that is more likely to be efficient for people nowadays with all this, uh, this pandemic situation, this uh, lack of work, uh, the prices of food, the medicine, and so on? Uh, because the world we are living in, is, it is the world, but uh, what can we do actually? How can we uh, make people to understand that uh, it's not a rational intelligence, we need uh, to combine uh, with uh, the emotional intelligence so can, we can survive and be somehow uh, happy. What do you think about that? You know, I I think we don't have enough people who are engaged in the actual acts of empathy, emotional intelligence, passion for other people. I I, I think, you know, in the future, we're, we're gonna have to learn how to care, really care about more than us more than our being we'll have to understand and i think some of the companies are starting to get to this if they're going to have customers that are going to be the base and the engine they're going to have to have workers that 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 they feel more about what the workers care about let me give you a case in point some of the work that I've been uh, researching, and uh, I just mentioned to you one of the books that I I, I, I did the forward on, the employer, employees, many of them, especially the upper skill ones, they have a choice and, and, and they are being bidded away by other companies. And what is making the difference is when the employers understand what is important to them, in their community and how they go out to that. Uh, let me give you a more concrete example. Deloitte now is putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into the communities of where the people that work for them come from so that those people can give back to their communities, can volunteer, can be supported that are not directly related to their work. So I, I I, I think it's coming along, uh, Roberto, 
it is not where we need to be, but I think we, we eventually, for those who are successful, we will eventually get there. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there is another question which I would like to ask you because I think uh, you, you are in full command on this. What is the role of social media, social media in, in the future of the society? Because you see, uh, in our days, I see Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and so on, so many other media. Uh, you know, they are creating a new reality. It could be a false or it could be true. And uh, people, if they don't have the right education, uh, you see, they, they may uh, they may accept what is really wrong, even for themselves. And uh, how do you think we can have some kind of uh, intellectual control? I'm not talking about uh, you know dictatorship. It 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 is an intellectual control. Uh, because you see, social media I could not carry on in this way, because you see they are misleading people. Uh, for instance, I watched the Divici uh, in Chile and I get fed up after a while and then I, I move into BBC One because there they are news. Here what we have is uh, a second class or second third, uh, third class uh, history about, uh, you know, tragedy, uh, something we think which are not very nice for everybody and they are not really teaching young people because you see as our children are indoors and they are watching the kind of things. What do you think uh, we should do really uh, to change the attitude and the view of the social media nowadays? That's even a harder question because, you know, at, at least with books, there's some kind of control with, uh, yeah, and it varies from country to country. I think just like you made choices, I think others and, and I, the, 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 the students, the children, they are very young, but they're making their choices now. Many of them are addicted to a lot of the games that are coming out, uh, not just the social media. And as we, as we grow this new industry, this new access, this new ability to find community that doesn't exist or didn't exist before. I mean, when I was born, there was no social media. The only way you had community is in real live people. Well, today you in Chile, I'm in the US. You have colleagues from India, all over the world. We have access. That is the good part of it. The not so good part of it is that just as there is uh, good information, there is bad information. And how do you monitor it? How do you, how do you support what really should be getting uh, access by the younger people? That's a big, broad question. And I think we will face, we face it now. Uh, and we don't have very many answers. There are not very many good controls, to, uh, especially for those who don't know better. And I would say that's the younger folks. But you mentioned earlier in the talk that we have a responsibility and an obligation as senior, seasoned, experienced uh, leaders and researchers to inform, to, 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 to counsel, to support, not dictate, but to encourage and motivate and share that everything that you see is not necessarily true and you should go through scientific method and other methods to test for the truth, to seek the truth. And that one, I don't believe it's gonna be a one size fit all. What, what is going on in Chile and how you address that in Chile may not be how you address it in Nairobi, Kenya, where you know the, uh, there's a different in access or in China. So I think as leaders in the different parts of the world, we have a responsibility to advocate for good information, the development of, the caring of, the access of, and the delivery of truth. Well, that's very true, you see, because sometimes uh, information may create uh, realities. And therefore, if the information is false, and you see what kind of reality is going to be for these kind of people which are really uh, not very well educated. 
And you know, for the, as far as I'm concerned, I think a good education means a lot. And uh, for instance, I used to have a long chat with uh, Professor uh, Roy Kaufman, who rests in peace, a, a great friend of mine. And he was such a, a, a wonderful person that uh, I told this uh, to Mariano Bernardes, and I can tell you that Roger Kaufman was working in Chile as well. Huh? You forgot that, so please uh, do include that. Which is very important. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Roger, uh, my good friend. And uh, you see, uh, I keep on uh, posting uh, his photograph and that kind of things because I, I want people to follow uh, his legacy. He did a lot. And I don't think that many, many people know uh, his work in this part of, in this side of the world. And therefore uh, they should read a, a bit more. Roya was such an open man that, that uh, he didn't tell me that he was very ill. And once I wrote to him and I said, could you please uh, give me uh, some kind of uh, an interview or something? And he said, well, if it is for you, the answer is yes. And the man was actually dying, actually. And therefore, it, it is very sad. But on the other hand, I feel very happy that I think that uh, the book, your book is going to be dedicated to him, or at least you are going to say something about him. Because you see, he created reality. And he was really very, very much open to this, open to discuss this with uh, as many people as possible. Uh, the last thing I would like to ask you, because you know, before you go, is about the quality of the education. There are many people, and well, I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, what do you think? Do you think that the quality of the education that people are getting in average, you know very well uh, Pakistan, I know because I, I know a lot of people in Pakistan, you know India, you have been over there as well. And I think you, you visit places where I have a lot of friends. <laughs> we have a very common interest. And uh, one of my granddaughter went to uh, Nairobi, Kenya as well. And she was there for a long time helping those people as well. So there are some kind of links, whether we like it or we know, but uh, that, that is the point. Well, and what do you think about the, what we're doing as far as education is concerned? Okay, now we could take off the gloves. Education needs an overhaul around the world. Uh, industry is saying that worldwide we're not producing and I'm talking about the uh, from education from K through 12 and then from uh, the higher ed sector, we are not producing what they need as fast as they need it because the technology and innovation is changing so fast. So what many of the employers have done is they've taken off the need to have a college degree. IBM uh, H, uh, uh, Human Resource Director indicated in an interview, 75% uh, of the world does not have college degrees and they don't want to miss uh, a tap in that part of the labor force. So right now, 50% of the, uh, the 50 of the jobs at IBM do not require a college degree. And why is that? They're relying more on certifications and ability to perform and uh, agility and uh, 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 other factors to groom the workforce of the future. It is, it is gonna be very different. So we as educators, we as educators need to do more collaboration, private public sector collaborations with the governments, with uh, corporations, and, and, and to find out where are the skill sets that we need to be developing this workforce. And those who are able to do that well, they will thrive. And those who continue what we've done in the past, without regard to the needs of the future, they will find themselves lacking, as I say, more and more enrollment. And you know, with, with COVID, it has shown us that remote education, remote learning, it might not be our favorite, but it is doable. And so the students that you have today, 
can go to, to classes in Nairobi, can go to classes in Dakar, can go to classes anywhere, whereas before we had a geographic, more of a geographic limitation. And I will tell you, I've been around and long enough to say, when distance education first came in, a lot of educators in the higher ed sector said, oh, it will never last. Uh, many colleagues who got degrees from online institutions found that they had real difficulty getting placed as college professors. Well, the world is different. It is flat now. And so not only is the remote learning accepted, but remote work is accepted. And so as educators, we've got to find a way to rebirth, transform education uh, that really will work for the people. And again, I go back to uh, our friend Roger, and you're right, the book is dedicated to Roger. Right in the beginning of the book, uh, it talks about Roger Conklin and his influence on our work. We need to be working from the bottom up, meaning listening to our students, listening to our community, listening to the industries, and finding out how we can retool, reshape what we have into what we need. I, I, you can see it now, many educational institutions, at least in the US and other places, have not survived and they were not surviving before COVID and COVID made things worse. And so I say to you, my friend, we can be pioneers again in education and developing the kind of education that is really going to meet the needs of the industries, but more importantly, of our people. How are the people going to survive if they're not able to work? Uh, there are many models around about universal income, but I will say to you, universal income does not give your ego satisfaction. And as you go back to your initial, the very first uh, lecture, I heard you uh, talk about a physicist talking about happiness. I mean, you know, we get our sense of being from our ability to contribute our ability to be humane and human. And so for that, we have to fight for those who can't fight for themselves, for the ability for all to, uh, to work and, 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 and have income to take care of themselves and their families. And so that was a long answer to a short question. Well, yes, but uh, it, it is very important and I do acknowledge you. Uh, I don't know if uh, Chanel would like to ask something. Chanel, can you hear me? I don't think uh, Chanel is uh, listening to me properly. <laughs> <laughs> I see Chanel, what he is doing, he's a very good friend. He, he worked with me here in Chile no, for no. 10 months. I, I saw he got connected and got back and get back to sleep again. <laughs> you hear me now? Yeah, now I hear you very well. Go on. Uh, it's uh, some connection problem. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Professor Dean Roll. It's uh, really it's a fantastic uh, work you have done, and it will give a wonderful path for uh, young entrepreneurs to do business in uh, several countries especially in the United States. And thank you so much for that. It will be a guide for us. I hope so. Thank you. Well, this is very yeah. important, I think. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, you still have energy. I know you, you are back on the road again. <laughs> <laughs> I will used to say. And well, uh, please, uh, you are uh, later keep in touch because uh, there is a lot of work and some ideas uh, we have here. Uh, all we have here is some ideas. I don't know if they are good or bad, but uh, they are ideas. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to make more. And not just talking, you see, we have to make more and try to find uh, new ways for young people. And I would like them to be uh, happy and to have a good family and so on. And uh, if we can do something about the future of work, and put forward to our politician, whoever they are, that uh, there are some uh, structural measurement to be taken for new uh, for for the new approach. Uh, that would be absolutely wonderful before we pass away. Anyway, uh, well, if I don't know, but uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who have uh, attended uh, this uh, webinar. In, 
este, Carlos Contreras, eh, good friend Thank of you mine. Very much. My dear friend, uh, Professor Ambarasan, we are in touch on a regular basis every day, actually. Thank you, he's, thank uh, you. Perhaps uh, you don't know him, uh, but he's a brilliant scientist, uh, Professor Ambarasan. He has a beautiful curriculum vita, and uh, he has, I think, one son and one uh, daughter. Uh, I don't know if they are both studying medicine, but uh, he's a, you know, a very qualified person and a beautiful human being. He was the uh, supervisor and the professor of uh, Shanavas. And, uh, and Shanavas has done a lot of uh, science concern. He has published a lot and he's, uh, he's a beautiful human being. Uh, well, uh, Joan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, do pass on to your family. I wish I could you, speak you. some time with the Grace. I, I know uh, the name. <laughs> and some photograph. And um, well, and I speak to uh, Abigail sometime in the near future. So if you can make some kind of conference, that would be absolutely wonderful, right? To know them very well. Well, thank you very much uh, to everybody. And uh, I'm going to send you the link of this uh, beautiful uh, international webinar. Thank you, John Roll, and God bless you. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you. In this occasion, I want to thank Professor Roberto to arrange uh, this kind of meetings very frequently. It is going to help a lot uh, for many future of many young people, and especially this talk is going to help many young entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Well, I think uh, we are just uh, about to finish. I, know, I don't know if uh, Professor Ambarasan wants to say something else. Or... Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice uh, talk arranged, uh, which is very interesting. And also the uh, many chapters discussed about uh, se section wise, and uh, it elaborated many entrepreneurship uh, leadership quality and uh, many approaches they have followed. Uh, apart from that, uh, how it leads to different countries to countries, how the student from uh, many micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs development, what are the problems come across. And what are the uh, ratios, discrimination, like uh, um, men and women? These are all very interesting discussions uh, she uh, included in that uh, work piece. So I thank particularly, as, I, as my observation, it is very interesting and a very uh, in-depth knowledge it uh, propagates. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Carlo, uh, would you like to say something before we go, my dear friend? Oh, yes, to acknowledge your uh, kind invitation and also to appreciate, uh, I will repeat that, the excellent talk we have heard from Dr. Roll. Huh? Uh, the subject is very interesting and no doubt it's, there is much, much, much more to talk about it particularly the role of uh, new people, of young people who have the future in their hands. Maybe they don't know exactly, but they should get a uh, conscience of that uh, future role. Huh? The question maybe is how can we enthusiast uh, to, to, to make them engage in this problem? I guess there is not problem of just talk to talk old people and young people, but we need some structural, structural reformulation, structural changes in our society. So to, to make these young be able to, to participate in the future of the country. Uh, it used to, it, people used, used to say that po uh, uh, poverty was produced just because alliteration and, and lazy, and people was lazy and illiterate. But I think the main point is that they need to have chances, opportunities, opportunities, which maybe they can all not always provide by themselves. That, so we need an, a, a, a great change in our structure to 
a possibility to give the possibilities that people get in this new structure real possibilities to grow up. That's the only thing I want to say, and I want to thank again for the kind invitation and the very nice, a very interesting talk. Well, the, only, the, the last thing I would like to say is that uh, I wish uh, every, everybody in the world, of course, and in particular uh, India, who is suffering a lot because of this uh, pandemic, uh, the very best. I have India in my heart and also have, uh, well, some people, many people, you see, when you say some, you don't define how many people are, we are talking about, how many millions of people but uh, there are a lot of people in my heart and uh, I just send you the very big wishes and uh, you can count on me uh, at any time. Uh, so uh, you enroll a, a big kiss for you, a great hook and uh, be happy. <laughs> so I want you and try to be in touch on a more regular basis. I know you are a very busy lady, but uh, <laughs> so try to be in touch from time to time. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, and goodbye to everybody. Yeah. Bye Have bye. Bye bye to everybody. Have a nice day. And be happy. <laughs> and blessed life. I'm very blessed. Uh, be blessed. Uh, thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye. bye. I'm going to say bye, bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Have bye, a nice bye. day. Yeah. Bye, my friends. Bye. Bye.